He looked across the river. In the underbrush, a lanky, dark-bearded guy snapped pictures of the bridge. What the hell is this? Grafton quickly stepped away from the barrier and they followed him. That man had a camera. He squinted and pulled out his radio. This is Grafton. Below the bridge on the south side. There's an individual shooting pictures along the bank. Looks harmless, but I don't want to take any chances. Ruin that camera and get him out of here. This is Grafton. Guys, our photographer friend is departing the area in a green sob. The radio crackled again. We're stuck, Craig. Grafton leaned over the edge and almost lost his balance. A large food truck unloaded crates at a restaurant along the water. He turned back to the sob, now moving along the river road. Schultz hit his fist on the barrier. Damn, we don't need this. Suppose that guy works for somebody. We don't know that said Grafton, but his thoughts were fixated on Roland James. The radio sounded. Craig. Grafton held the radio. Go ahead. An Iowa license plate. We have the first two numbers, five, six. The sob disappeared into the bushes. Nobody knew about this meeting except Tillman and Schultz. He had to hope that this bearded guy was a tourist snapping nature shots. Take those two numbers. Contact who you need to in Iowa. Have the computers match up a green sod to those first two numbers. Schultz face grafted. I don't like this, Craig. No need for panic. Nothing's happened. Panicking over nothing is a waste of energy. Schultz rubbed his hands together. Then we need to get out of here. What about the sob? Asked Tillman. Grafton stared at the riverbank. They'll get him, Warren. Won't take long. Roy Garrison is just one of many characters who get sucked into this huge covert operation in Africa called Green Haze. Picture an enormous black hole sucking in all matter and all type of solar debris, everything in a solar system into its vortex and down into the black hole to disappear into another dimension or another part of space. This is what happens to every one of these characters who are in this book. Garrison is a reporter for the Los Angeles Dispatch. He heads up to the high desert on a lead from a Mrs. Lynette Campbell, a lawyer. The lead seems to be rather enticing about a van that's tipped over in the desert, spilling a highly organic compound onto the asphalt and into the dirt of the desert. What he finds out later, it's VED, Viral Endoplasmic Disease. He sits in a silver diner, pondering whether he should go forward in the story. He's actually on his way to his brother's house in San Luis Obispo, but stops at the Campbell's massive spread up in the high desert. He finds right away that a local man named Grover Moses died from a sudden viral onslaught. But it turns out, and this is what prevents him from initially calling in his story, that nobody saw this van over tip except for Grover. This rock and wood house is lined with expensive cars, but Lynette Campbell is under tremendous pressure. She looks strained. She speaks of an overturned vehicle. She said that Grover saw military vehicles descend upon the area. Men emerged in white plastic hazmat type uniforms. They sprayed the van with aerosol and cleaned up the area. There are traces of morotoxin. Garrison says he needs proof. He goes to his car to have a cigarette and to get his recorder out of the vehicle. He crosses the yard to the car and he stares at the Campbell's barn as he grabs his recorder. He has to get the information that's on that personal computer. He starts his recorder to add some additional notes to his story. A bright flash illuminates the entire area and the rear window of Roy Garrison's car is pulverized. A secondary blast occurs shaking the car. Intense wavy light is spread across the area. The house has been completely destroyed. In a matter of minutes, as Garrison recovers from the blast, sirens and lights and cops descend upon the area and then upon him. They rifle his pockets and look at his license. He's questioned thoroughly. Fire trucks arrive and then an ambulance. Garrison now believes that this story is far beyond a small article for his paper. 
Other cars arrive, and Garrison is placed in a cruiser. He overhears that the FBI is flying in from San Francisco, but the question circulating around Roy Garrison's head is who is behind this, and why would they want this story stopped? A short time later, helicopters sound in the air. He hears that Bruce Keaton, an FBI agent that Garrison knew long ago in L.A., has arrived on scene. After a few opening comments with Garrison and talk of the old days, Keaton orders him a black coffee. He wants to know what the hell Roy Garrison knows. He takes Garrison down to the diner where Garrison had had dinner just hours before. Garrison talks about the VED concerns. Garrison makes a point to Keaton that he doesn't want to drop this story, but Keaton insists that he cover it up. He also knows something about Garrison. Garrison is $158,000 in the hole. Garrison just shakes his head. Why does this have to be Keaton who has arrived on scene? Keaton insists that Grover Moses' story about the van overturning was bogus. He admits to a classified operation, but it's as if he doesn't know everything about it and claims there was no van. Keaton says he'll get back to Garrison Garrison should hold the story back. Craig Grafton is deputy security director for an intelligence agency. He gets calls from other agents mentioning something about Green Haze. He hears about the Garrison incident up at the high desert and orders people to shadow Garrison. And then the agent says the telltale phrase, which Grafton doesn't really answer. Lake Shar is blue in the summer. The story switches to two other characters who are drawn into this vortex, Sam and Nina Peters. Sam and Nina have left their one-year-old son Jason with his grandparents. They're in St. Augustine, Florida for a getaway. They talk about actually relocating there in the warmer weather. Later in the day, as Nina prepares for supper, Sam brings his green sob with a bike rack along the shore and the river. He starts photographing the area. However, on the bridge spanning the river is Craig Grafton from the security agency. He's standing with the CEO of a pharmaceutical company and a bag man for organized crime. He's leaving for Africa in the morning. After 24 years, he's also leaving the agency. He's baffled by a blonde who jogged by him in Toronto and said that very same statement, Lake Shar is blue in the summer. And then at a Montreal dinner party, he meets a chip tooth arms dealer named Roland James, who speaks about the Pangea rebels in Africa. Schultz is on the bridge with him in a party shirt and shorts. Grafton is wearing a turtleneck and pants. He mentions that the Green Haze operation is going forward. He mentions that Garrison is now on his way to his brother's home in San Luis Obispo. And then he switches to talk of the actual coup d'etat that will occur in Pangea. The replacement for the president in Bhutto will be Colonel Manville, who is pleased that they've dropped a weapons shipment at Lake Shar in Pangea. Manville is egotistical and not thought of very highly by Grafton. Grafton likes the more educated General Seville, educated at Columbia. Cam Pritchard back at the agency is handling the Garrison thing. Garrison is now a liability. Grafton, however, is consumed by the Chinese connection, and he likes going around the agency and dealing with the Chinese surreptitiously. As Grafton speaks with his people on the bridge, he notices Sam Peters taking pictures along the shore. Immediately, he alerts his people, and they match up the plate numbers on the sob. Then begins the saga of Sam and Nina Peters. Sam dines with his wife and they mention how they're going to Kentucky on their way back to Iowa to see their friend Griff from college. He longs to hold his son Jason back in Iowa. He orders a 21 year old champagne and raises his glass as he says St. Augustine will reign eternal. They stroll along the river holding hands. When they return to the hotel, the police are in the parking lot. Someone has attacked their room and everything is gone. Then outside, more agents are pilfering through the sob. Sam and Nina flee the scene. They hijack a truck which later crashes into the brush. They run through the bushes toward the river as more cars follow. 
The truck goes up in a fireball and they jump into the river. As they emerge on the other side past the bridge, they have eluded their pursuers for the time being. Grafton realizes that the men in Florida have messed up. Now he has two messes on his hands, Garrison and the Peters. He has not found the photos or the camera that Sam Peters used to take pictures of them on the bridge. The Peters are definitely missing. He speaks with Charlie McCabe from the central office. Now the incident has escalated to the director, Edgar Mitchell. A new plan is adopted. They will blame the Peters for the hotel killings. They'll plan evidence. Grafton is unable to obtain anything substantial on the Peters' background. He connects to the Florida units and soon the media are duped and they blame the Peters for the hotel killings. Edgar Mitchell is then called. Grafton is leaving within hours for a fake mission. His F-16 in Pangaea will be shot down, supposedly by rebels 30 miles south of the capital of Argos. Back in California at San Luis Obispo, Garrison is at his brother Richard's house. Garrison is torn about not writing about the incident in the BED. Richard has been working crazy hours at his restaurant. The Peter's room in Florida is actually on the TV. His brother Richard wants Roy to take care of himself. Arriving at Richard's house is a brown wrapped square, postmarked Merced, California. Garrison soon realizes that everything that was on the Campbell's computer is on this CD. This is the break he's been looking for, but he knows he's being followed. They head out to Richard's office to use the computer. On the screen, he finds a three-dimensional image of the morotoxin and another substance called Pizac compound. He needs somebody with more expertise, somebody who knows at least college chemistry. He then requests a map of California to try and link up where that van was going and from where. He finds a direct link to a military access road of the Dempsey Cullen Reservation to where the van overturned in the desert. As he's looking at this, something shakes the building, this commotion outside. He moves upstairs to the storage loft, this machine gun fire and his brother Richard is dead. They need to get him out and they put him in a laundry basket and the waiter actually plugs one of the agents. They move outside and he points out a bus stop to Garrison across the baseball field. Garrison quickly enters the bus, but he realizes that several joggers from the restaurant are after him. He tells the bus driver to run the light. The bus driver is reluctant, but takes $100 to do exactly what he says. And then Garrison realizes if he didn't run the light, they would have caught him and killed him. Grafton is now in Africa. He's uncertain about General Seville. Tomorrow morning his F-16 will participate in the fake shootdown outside of Argos, blaming President Mbuto and bringing Colonel Manville to power. Grafton is brought in by helicopter and meets with Seville, then some Mbutu people. He checks his famous Luga that he keeps on his person at all times. He meets with Ian Summer, the U.S. Ambassador, but it is the egotistic Seville in full uniform with his medal shaking on his chest that really annoys Grafton. In his mind, he thinks about the deal he's made with the Chinese. He will assume a nameless identity on some remote Aegean island and leave the area with $25 million. He looks into the harbor to the oil platform's red lights and the tankers in the distance. Cam Pritchard appears on the satellite. Pritchard informs Grafton that Garrison is on the loose now. It is at that time that Craig Grafton orders Garrison killed on sight. Sam and Nina, meanwhile, travel to their friend Griff up in the central part of the state. Griff says he'll hide them, and Sam alludes back to what he had heard on sight, something about a project called Green Haze. On the TV, they are told by the national media that the search for their bodies had been called off near the river. Sam is now afraid that the machine gun men would arrive up in Kentucky. Griff explains that he knows about the shootout, but Sam explains what really happened. Griff tells him to call the FBI or the news network, but Sam shakes his head and said they're probably in on it. They check with the photo lab where Sam had dropped off pictures in St. Augustine. Griff knows a security person that maybe can help them leave the area. Sam and Nina are on edge and fearful for their own lives. Cam Pritchett is now in charge at home while Grafton is away. The domestic side of Green Haze is a burgeoning problem. 
Explosions occur outside the capital, Argos, of Pangaea as Grafton settles in and prepares for his morning mission. Garrison has the CD and they can't find him, and the Peters are missing. None of this is affecting the actual operation of Green Haze in Africa. Grafton would parachute out and then fake being shot down by the rebels. Sinking in Budu and blaming him for the shootdown would assure that Manville got into power. The rebels would then secure Argos. They then foment an attack on an oil field to panic in Buto and persuade the U.S. public of what's going on. Grafton is extremely concerned. Garrison should have been killed twice. Sam Peters now has a handgun that Griff has given him. He's told that the local security guy, Griff's friend, could hide them and possibly help them get away from Kentucky. Griff explains that he can scan pictures into his own website. Griff is only six blocks away. Griff calls the lab in the morning to put a tracer on the prints which have not yet arrived in his mailbox. Garrison is now in the high desert. Somebody is making big dollars on outbreaks of VED. He gets on a payphone and calls his boss, Hobson, at the dispatch. Garrison's identity has been stripped at the paper and nobody knows who he is. He needs to go to his old girlfriend's house, Loretta, in San Pedro. Loretta, standing in a jogging suit, has tinted her hair red. She has broken up with her boyfriend. Garrison begins to tell his story. He tells about his suspicions of the VED. She recommends that he see her friend Sarah Humphreys at Laguna Beach, someone who can help him decipher what's on the CD. He thinks back to years ago, walking on Laguna Beach with Loretta. Grafton is in Africa, listening to the pompous General Seville. Seville doesn't know that Grafton is working with the rebels and the Chinese. He's in this only for profit at this stage of his career. Colonel Manville only wants power. The Pangeans have been crushed economically within the oil profits. Grafton thinks back to the domestic situation in the United States. Garrison and the Peters must die. A Mrs. Collins meets Grafton at Seville's residence. He has met Collins before in Canada at a cocktail party. As Seville is pontificating, Grafton thinks how the Chinese need him to remove Manville and bring in Seville so they can control the oil. Grafton treats the general like a child. Cam Pritchard hears about the Peters case back in the United States. Griff's security guy has leaked things out through his friends and it's trickled up through the agency. Griff the next morning arrives at the Triple Decker. He tells Sam and Nina that everyone thinks they're dead, but Sam is wondering if somebody has tipped them off. Later that morning, they wait for the mailer, but it has not yet arrived. They check at Griff's real estate office, but he's left and gone home. Sam calls Griff on the phone, but can't reach him. Everything is quiescent outside of Griff's house. Inside, a man in a gray sweatshirt approaches them, and Sam shoots him dead. As he moves forward, he finds Griff has been shot dead, and his computer monitor smashed. They assume that the guy in the sweatpants was a government agent. They get Griff's truck keys. The front door slams below. Three guys in suits enter Griff's house. He dives to the floor. Sam runs outside with Nina and enter Griff's truck. Sam spins out the truck and they move through town and onto a golf course. Police cruisers block the road to the fairway. He abandons the truck and they run to a bottled water truck and climb inside. Back in Africa, Grafton has begun his mission in the F-16. Later, he will disappear with millions from the Chinese. The oil interests will be finessed. Garrison is with Loretta in San Pedro. He's running for his life now. He wasn't fair to Loretta. He knows that now. He threw it all away. As the bus backs away, Loretta waves, and Garrison realizes what he has lost. You blew it, Roy. You have to find her again. He meets with Sarah Humphreys, who introduces him to Professor Morton. Morton looks at the 3D display on the computer. It is a breakdown of the viral endoplasmic disease virus. Death from that VED virus occurs within 48 hours. Prescott Pharmaceuticals manufacture the Pizac compound, which is the antidote. Garrison later discovers that there is a Prescott Pharmaceuticals plant in Bakersfield, California, not too far from the Dempsey Cullen Reservation. When he finally does leave the office the next morning and goes down to a McDonald's, three late model sedans are outside the building. He realizes that these people have killed Richard and the Campbells. He runs outside, leaps the fence, and just keeps running. 
but he is captured and dragged with handcuffs into a car. The handcuffs are later removed as Bruce Keaton arrives on the scene. He tells Garrison that they are in the middle of a classified security problem called Green Haze, that Prescott manufactures the virus, and that Garrison is in great danger. But Garrison says, what can you and I do about it? Keaton's capacity is limited. Keaton keeps telling Garrison even if he finds something out, he can't do anything. He can hide Roy and change his identity, but Garrison says hundreds are dead and they're laundering money. But Keaton refuses to act, and Garrison just tells him he's a guy who does what he's told. Back at a beach safe house, Garrison is in front of Keaton's laptop. He finds a Green Haze site posted by Griff, but the pictures are not on the site. Keaton knows about St. Augustine, but hasn't previously made the link. Garrison types in a message on Griff's site, saying they're after me too. He later sees a newspaper with a picture of Craig Grafton shot down in Pangaea. Sam and Nina have made it to Wisconsin. Nina wants to go home or even call home. Sam has Griff's card with all his website addresses on it. Their plan now is to flee to Canada. Then they discover the pictures, somehow uploaded to the site. The man with the wire rim glasses is Craig Grafton, the man on the bridge. They listen to a report of Mbuto being blamed for the government anti-aircraft downing of Craig Grafton's F-16. Sam realizes now he shot the wrong picture at the wrong time. Cam Pritchett is awaiting Grafton's status in Pangaea. His associate at the agency, Charlie McCabe, says they have to lure Garrison back to Loretta. They've already blamed Griff's death on Sam and Nina. And he says to Pritchett, if this thing breaks wide open, governments will fall. Grafton arrives by military jeep back in the capital, Argos. Colonel Mandel is taking orders from Grafton. He begins demanding things, but Grafton won't stand for it. He says he has the ability to bring him to success or scatter him to the wind. He takes out his Luger and says, this isn't your country anymore. But Grafton knows the truth that he's about to get 25 million from the Chinese and double cross Mitchell and the agency as he ends his career and passes into oblivion. Sam and Nina head to a computer store in Wisconsin. They ask for computer time on the internet. They find the photos of Grafton on the bridge and Garrison's message. They are afraid to contact Garrison, but they know they have to. At the safe house, Garrison sees the oil well fires and rebels near Agos, and Butu is in hiding. The UN Security Council has actually met about the situation. Keaton is talking with his agents on the beach. Grafton is in Argos, he tells Keaton, but Keaton says they have to leave immediately. He fears that things have gone out of control. Edgar Mitchell arrives in Argos. Manville cannot be trusted according to Grafton. He's incompetent. Most of the loyalists to Mbutu have surrendered. To Craig Grafton, who has done the impossible, he will use Manville for the objective of taking over the government and then switch to Seville. Mitchell mentions Mrs. Collins, but he also says the Peters and Garrison thing must be solved immediately. Sam and Nina watch the evolving Pangaea report on TV sets in a department store, and they watch Grafton step up to the microphone to confabulate his story of the F-16 shootdown. Edgar Mitchell brings in Roland James, the chip-toothed arms dealer. Grafton thinks about him back in the jungle and when he met him in Toronto on the balcony months ago. But he also thinks about the $25 million just waiting for him as soon as he accomplishes what he needs to do. He thinks about the remote Aegean Island. He brings James up on the roof and wants upfront money and Swiss bank numbers. The Chinese now want him to assassinate Manville, but he won't do it. He wants $2 million tomorrow night at the Rochambeau Hotel. When Grafton looks in the mirror, he sees himself as a traitor, but the $25 million is soothing over that image. The Chinese are trying to control the oil, and with Grafton's help, they will. The Americans and Mitchell suspect nothing. Cam Pritchett calls. Bruce Keaton is involved with Garrison, he tells Grafton. But that doesn't mean that much now, according to Grafton. Keaton is missing. There's a knock at the door. He wonders whether Pritchett knew about the Chinese operation. Two short Chinese men come into the room. Grafton grabs his Luger. As they try to intimidate, he demands $2 million up front. Then they tell him that he will do as they say. He fires his gun and kills them. He walks into the corridor with the briefcase for $2 million. He moves on to a rusted fire escape outside the window 
hops onto a moped stashed in the alley and leaves through traffic from the Hotel Montebon. Garrison has made contact with the Peters via the computer and is now in Racine, Wisconsin at the public library where he meets them. As they cross outside, Keaton emerges from a van by the crosswalk. He has a gun which upsets Sam Peters. Keaton is trying to find out who the other guys are in the picture. Then he imparts to them that this is a classified national security operation that's flying out of control. Back in Pangea, Seville would allow the rebels to take Argos. Explosions rack the city. Manville will take the capital and then be deposed after Mbutu's death. Manville addresses the country. Mrs. Collins calls to see Grafton but hangs up. Grafton leaves the hotel on a moped. This celebration of Mbutu's death in the streets. Grafton now suspects that Cam Pritchett is shadowing him and that Collins must be working alone. He meets a Mr. Chun at the oil tanker. He finds out then that Mrs. Collins wants his money. By a portable phone, a call is placed by Chun to a man named Polchek, and he gets the Swiss bank account numbers for Grafton. $23 million in accounts have been confirmed, along with the $2 million that Grafton already possesses. In a hotel room back in the United States, Keaton is speaking continuously on the phone. He's getting a live feed from Argos. Keaton now thinks the only way out is to blackmail Grafton. He knows about the VED and Prescott Pharmaceuticals. One of the guys in the picture on the bridge is William Schultz, CEO of Prescott Pharmaceuticals. The antidote drug is important. Prescott is just a shadow company for the intelligence agency. They've made millions on the outbreaks. In Africa, Grafton has stayed in his hotel room. He's not sure who he's dealing with now. He thinks about Galapos, the island in the Aegean, where he will take a surreptitious route and disappear forever. Chun has established links to the Chinese government and someone named Lao Hai. Grafton will escape from Pangea via a private freighter to Switzerland, where he will become Constantine Arianus on the remote island. Cam Pritchard calls on the phone. The Peters have linked up with Garrison and Keaton. Before he hangs up, he says one more thing to Grafton. Lake Shar is blue in the summertime. But then he says that woman should not invade the domain of sailing on Lake Shar. An obvious reference to Collins. But Grafton could not gun after Collins without alerting her contacts with incremental oil in the Chinese. Back in the United States, Garrison is skunking Sam Peters in Monopoly. Keaton comes into the room and says, this is very serious. He says, Grafton's people know they're in New York. Using Keaton's contacts, they leave immediately for a jet at the airport. Blackmailing a very sophisticated individual like Grafton may be impossible, said Garrison. Then there's commotion outside and he yells, upstairs. It's too late to escape and he can't find Keaton. Sam and Nina are gone. There are unmarked cars across the street and a man with a shortwave radio. Gunfire erupts in the square, jumps to the sidewalk and onto another building and into another street. Keaton's yellow station wagon is missing. Keaton's line rang and he left a message on Garrison's phone in the gas station. Keaton's car was indeed at the gas station down the street. Garrison gets inside and Keaton takes off very slowly. He moves up the ramp onto the highway. Garrison is livid that Sam and Nina have been left behind, but Keaton has had no choice. He mentions that Ronald Tillman, the other man in the picture, is part of a huge crime syndicate in the country. Money from the drug is going to rebels in Pangea. Keaton skids up the ramp back toward the city. He pulls to the side of the road and they enter a black Oldsmobile. As he slowly pulls away, Keaton outlines to Garrison that he has a poison pill website, and if people don't hear from him within 72 hours, everything gets made public into Congress's oversight committees and to the media. There's a jet at the end of a long runway. Within minutes, it shoots forward and angles upward, and they're on their way to Africa. Back in Africa, Manville, the rebel leader, is dead. General Seville is ready to address the nation as they taxi down toward Pangea. Craig Grafton and his merry men take over a sovereign country. Green Hayes is the Pangea takeover. Some British guy named Nate, who is really Roland James, has stuff on Craig Grafton. Grafton is sold out big time to the Chinese for 25 million. James wants 15 million dollars. 
Keaton says he'll give him a hundred thousand dollars a propeller driven plane then buzzes down the runway and they take a 35 minute flight into Argos killing Grafton would accomplish nothing they encounter five or six Mbutu loyalists but Roland James talks his way out of it and the Chrysler containing Garrison, Keaton, and James moves ahead. Keaton calls Grafton's agency in the United States, saying that Garrison and Keaton have information on him. Keaton calls a special line and leaves a message that Keaton and Garrison have information on Grafton, and he wants Grafton connected. But Garrison repeatedly says that they can't compete with this guy. Keaton is upset with Garrison's cynicism. The phone rings, and it's Grafton. Grafton then changes to a secure line. It is at that time that Keaton says they have a 72-hour check-in time with three sources. He says he has the pictures of the St. Augustine Bridge, and they know about the VED outbreaks around the world, how the London money is all documented. Grafton then wants them out at the refinery in three hours. Garrison then makes the comment as he hangs up that Grafton is above the game. An old taxi with cool vinyl seats heads for the refinery. They move past an oil tanker in the harbor. There's a fence with barbed wire and Keaton sees the checkpoint. A black man in a camouflage uniform moves out. He hits Keaton and then Garrison's license is checked. The soldier takes them to an American and the American says he knows about the website. They put a handgun to Keaton's temple, but Keaton repeatedly tells them, don't say anything, Roy. Grafton appears above on a catwalk in the refinery. He tells Cam Pritchard to put down the gun. There's a pop and Keaton is murdered. Then there's a rifle crack. Keaton is face down, but the American, Cam Pritchard, is dead on top of him. Garrison cries and looks up toward Grafton and says there will be justice. He climbs the metal stairway above the refinery. There are burning oil and rig flames in the distance. Grafton, as a gesture of goodwill, hurls his weapon over the railing. At that time, a long-haired blonde woman appears down the catwalk. She walks ahead. Garrison fires, but Grafton riddles her body with bullets and kills her. As Grafton moves forward, Garrison kills him and says there is a price to be paid. In the epilogue, a groundskeeper moves toward a long food table on a remote Greek island. A Mr. Arianus, an older man with cropped hair, moves forward with his wife. His wife is named Loretta. Constantine Arianus is Roy Garrison. And their 21-year-old blonde kid is Jason, the son of the Peters.